Welcome in to this week three edition of the show from the shoe. It is an, a Northern Illinois preview and a Hawaii review and a Tim May filled version of the show from the shoe. So we have on Tim May. He's a football beat writer, an Ohio State football beat writer for the Columbus Dispatch. Tim, thank you very much for joining us. Aloha, mi amigos. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs> really, do, really do appreciate I'm still, it. I'm still stuck on that Hawaii time, man. Sorry about that. No doubt about it. We wish we could be uh, rolling with that same weather a couple months from now, but unfortunately it will not be the same. Uh, sitting next to me on my right is Colin Hassel, as it has always been. How are you doing, Colin? I, I'm doing just fine. I'm looking forward to discussing this. I'm a little, I'm a little worried. I know we're about to start with the quarterback discuss, discussion, though, and that was not pretty. Absolutely. And before we jump into that, I just wanted to ask Tim one thing. Now, Tim, I have been to a couple of press conferences uh, for Ohio State, an Urban Meyer one with the players. And you just go for it, man. You just jump right in, ask and asking everybody questions. Were you like that growing up, or were you just a curious person, or is it something that has developed over time? Well, uh, I don't understand anybody. I, I, number one, I always have plenty of questions to ask because you get very little access to these guys anymore. And number two, I remember one time I had a guy who was a co beat writer with me at one point who. Uh, <laughs> We were at, I think it was a Jeff press conference. I asked a question just before he did, and he said, man, that was the question I was going to ask. And I went, wait a minute. You came to this press conference and you only had one question to <laughs> ask Jim Trussell? Are you kidding me? And the uh, bottom line is, I mean, I, I would like some days to be able to ask most of the questions. That's just because, you know, I'm, I'm curious and I, I want to know the answers to a lot of things. And, you know, you have to kind of pick your spots, and you know, as you as you all know, you know, during the week, I mean, I probably write eight or nine, ten stories, maybe more than that during the week, considering all the stuff that we put out from on the web to our game day plus section to our our, our daily sections, and uh, you know, you you kind of have to ask questions about those things you're working on. You can't always get the conversational kind of uh, question and answer. But yeah, I've always got a million questions. I've always asked. A million questions. I'm, I'm known as the just one more guy in the group. That's just the way I am. That's uh-huh. the way Jim Trestle still refers to me. And so uh, I don't apologize for that at all because that's my job. <laughs> no, don't, don't. It's very, it's very interesting to watch. It was just an observation I had, and thank you very much for answering. You make some good points there. But let's get into some football. Uh, Ohio State, a uh, thirty-eight to nothing victory this weekend over the Hawaii uh, Rainbow <laughs> Warriors. I like to say that, right? Uh, sloppy game though Ohio State only with 17 points through three quarters and I want to jump into the quarterback situation right away Cardale Jones not a great game JT Barrett replaces him with seven minutes left in the second quarter didn't play extremely well either what did you see out of that out of the quarterback situation that maybe gave you some pause on how Urban Meyer is going to handle it going forward it didn't give me pause at all what I saw was an offensive game plan that I didn't think was very good I mean not not mediocre, but I just didn't think it was hitting the nail that was sitting there in the board, which was like, go right at those guys. And I wrote about that. And, you know, if you were at Monday's uh, press conferences when I even asked Taylor Decker about was I, you know, was I accurate in making that assessment, that the best thing, you know, Ohio State, Ohio State had going for it on Saturday, four and a, literally four and a half days after it had played at Virginia Tech, was just lining up and just, you know, being superior, meaning they are a better group as a whole than Hawaii. You know, just do that. And uh, I thought when they did that, that's when they looked the best with both quarterbacks. But, you know, uh, it was just a disjointed sort of attack, in my opinion. They were still trying to uh, get, all, get all the right notes and uh, get everybody involved and run wide. I mean, the wide stuff just literally wasn't working on a consistent basis. And I think they really hindered the quarterbacks. And obviously, you know, they didn't pick up some blitzes. Uh, Different little things, you know, you can nitpick from here and there. I mean, one, one bad play kind of makes about three look bad, you know what I'm saying. So, um, back to what you were asking me, I think both quarterbacks look sort of uncomfortable in the plan. And it showed, and both of them obviously missed some plays. Uh, JT missed a couple of passes, which is uncharacteristic of him. And that's why he ended up with a 14-0 lead to half and a 17-0 lead after three quarters. Uh, but then again, you know, considering the challenge of number one playing a game on a Monday night, getting back at uh, 
three at three thirty four o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, playing another game at three thirty p.m. Uh, on Saturday. Just get coming up with a with a sound plan against a team you haven't played before, and then number two, knowing how wide they're. What, their real chance was to come in and just play all out defense, and they did that. I thought Hawaii had a really good plan on defense, and uh, that all conspired to make it look as bad as it looked. Yet Ohio mm-hmm. State still scored what four touchdowns with its offense, kicked the field goal, and whatever that was, it went on on that first field goal attempt. I'm still not clear on that. I asked uh, uh, Jack Willoughby uh, the other day if that was a fake, and he said, no, it wasn't a fake. I said, well, man, it sure looked like one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so one of the, so another thing that I want to talk about on, about the quarterbacks is when when I when Cardale came when Cardale was replaced by JT with seven minutes to go in the second quarter, I was I was pretty surprised, and it was just because previously in the Virginia Tech game we saw Ohio State go down at the half, seventeen to fourteen, and they and they stuck with Cardale. But I but do you think that when when Urban Meyer decided to pull Cardale and and put JT in the game? Do you think that was an opportunity for JT just to come in and right the ship that 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 Ohio State's offense had not been doing well, or do you think it was an opportunity for him to take the starting job? Both. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, if he had come in and been extremely effective and driven that team to a couple of touchdowns, you know, we might be looking at a different situation now as starting quarterback field goes because this is a because Urban, Urban Meyer, in my opinion, is not kidding. This is an ongoing situation. As he said, uh, you know, the other day, clarifying, and I even, I even wrote this in uh, in Monday's paper beforehand. I mean, the the telltale sign that Cardinal Jones is the starter was the fact that he started the third quarter because neither one of them had done anything in the first half to really put one over the other. But as as, as Urban Meyer also said, Cardinal Jones is the starter now because he was not beaten out in preseason camp, and he's the guy that finished the season last year. But number two, it is an ongoing competition. So, you know, JT pretty much has to has to take those uh, those opportunities when he can to, to prove that he should be the starter. So I know that's a roundabout way of answering your question, but I just I truly believe this is an ongoing competition. Mm-hmm. And if they have another sort of mediocre game again, it's gonna be going from like every all of us talking about how great a deal it is to uh, all of us scratch our head like, hey, what's gonna happen here, you know? I agree with you, and I think it's one of the more fascinating things going forward just in college football in general. And when I saw JT come into the game in that second quarter, it just it felt like he sort of had control of things, but then he just didn't play that well. And I was kind of surprised that that was the case. But looking up front on the offensive line, obviously there were a bunch of mistakes, false starts, penal- just penalties, fumbled snaps, a lot of mistakes – Urban Meyer talked about how Hawaii had a schematic advantage. Would you chalk that performance up to more of that, or would you say, well, maybe just the offensive line didn't play that well? Okay, so go back and you know, and you do your history. Navy played a very similar defense last year. So did Indiana. You know, and everybody remember how we were all like scratching our head, what's going on in this Indiana game? I mean, they're supposed to, you know make the fence with Indiana. Well, everybody forgot, you know, that Indiana team beat Missouri earlier in the year. Uh, and one of the reasons they beat them was because of their defense. But number two, uh, you know, they're playing an odd man front. They were throwing all kinds of different little blitzes at them. Unpredictable, uh, inconsistent, meaning they, the blitzes were coming from different, different directions every other play. And uh, I'm talking about Saturday. And so it was, it was really a tough game for that Ohio State offensive line to get a handle on. I thought what would have cooled Hawaii's Jets uh, would have been throwing the ball down the field more often, especially with Michael Thomas involved. I thought Michael Thomas was a mismatch all day long for that uh, Hawaii defensive backfield. And uh, Ohio State did throw to I mean, they threw to him in pitches sometimes, you know, that one of those third down plays where he came back real strong, got the ball, and uh, kept back up field. But those were, those were the kind of plays that would have, like, slowed down why I made it rethink some of the stuff it was doing. Uh, but, you know, it's whenever you've got three and a half days to prepare for something, you're probably not going to see a, much, a lot of the rest of the, the year. It's very tough, especially when you consider how much effort they put into preparing for the Virginia Tech defense. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I kind of expected it. I didn't expect it necessarily on the schedule because I thought they would eventually, you know, just superior offensive talent would take over and 
know, Braxton Miller or one of Jalen Marshall, somebody would just break a play, mm -hmm. and that would sort of break their back. But that didn't happen because Hawaii was hell bent on not letting it happen. Yeah, and one of the things behind the offensive line that Ohio State's really done frequently, and, and more than I expected, is they've lined up Braxton at quarterback a ton, a ton. And I, I really didn't anticipate it being this frequent when they moved Braxton to H-back and wide receiver. Did, did you anticipate this, and do you, think, do you think this was in the plans all along? Because to me, it just seems like it's, it's slightly an injury risk to Braxton, someone who's, who we've already seen is, has, been fragile, has been fragile in the past. And I just wasn't expecting this. Do you think... Did, do you, did you expect this? Absolutely. Absolutely expected it. Uh, the Wildcat with Braxton Miller in it, especially as he develops uh, his right arm again and, he, and him having the possibility of throwing the ball again, uh, you know, maybe not 30 times a game, but three times a game. I thought it was absolutely expected that. Uh, number three, you know, if you're going to play big time football, you're going to get hit. I don't care if they put you at punter. As uh, Darren Lee proved, <laughs> yep. you're you're gonna you're gonna have contact, and uh, and especially if you're gonna if Rex Middle's gonna touch the ball 10, 12, 15 times a game, he's gonna get hit a lot, no matter where they put it. So uh, getting into the edge like they did against Virginia Tech with a chance to cut it up is one of the more lethal potential plays in college football this year. And Urban Meyer knows that. We all know that. Uh, Braxton, you know. Is Pretty much wash his hands to a certain extent of playing quarterback. So you use you use him at what his strength is. I mean, it's basically he's not Jerry Rice or Chris Carter running routes yet, you know. Yep. Uh, but you get the ball in his hands, whether you start with it in his hands or uh, you you give him flips or you throw in passes and stuff, he has a chance to break every play he's involved in. I thought one of the interesting thing was I think he did I think he did for one. Didn't he do one shovel pass or one pitch the other day? I think he did, if I'm not mistaken. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they're already showing some things they might be doing with him down the road. I thought that absolutely he added a spark to the offense that was kind of – that was just not moving the ball very well. Whenever he stepped on the field, they seemed to gain yards. I mean, he's gaining seven yards per carry. And it it's like you have to understand – you understand what Ohio State's going to do if you're Hawaii when Braxton Miller comes on the field. I mean, I, didn't, I don't remember him giving the ball to Ezekiel Elliott at all, but – I thought that it was very successful whenever he came on the field. It had a spark. And you talk about just the glut of playmakers that Ohio State has, and Curtis Samuel gets seven catches. And like I said, Braxton Miller gets seven yards per carry. How well is Ed Warner doing of getting all these guys involved, and how difficult is that going to be going forward with just just how, how many they have? As I like to say, when a helicopter is operating correctly, it is a sight to behold. <laughs> Sitting on the ground, straight up in the air, you know, without any forward movement or anything. It's just a miracle looking thing. When it's not working well, as one guy I knew used to fly helicopters used to say, it's a million pieces all trying to fly apart at once. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's what this Ohio State offense has the, has the chance to be on any given Saturday is when uh, some things just aren't synced up, you know, it can look disjointed. That disjointedness can also lead to a big play one from one moment to the next because you've got Jalen Marshall, he's proven he can take it to the house. You've got Preston Miller, Ezekiel Elliott, or Michael Thomas involved. Curtis Samuel hasn't quite had that real big time play where you go, wow, but you know it's there because of his, his speed and his quickness, uh, which aren't to be confused. Uh, those things are there. And uh, it's just a matter of them uh, getting them going. I mean, you know, let's face it, the win at Virginia Tech was a big play affair, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, back the middle for 54 yards on a pass, back the middle for 53 on a, on a spin and sprint, as I called it, you know? <laughs> uh, those are the kind of plays that this offense is capable of. But when they don't get them, it does turn into a little bit of a mully gully push down the field sort of thing. And that's when they kind of, that's when their identities. You know, clash. Uh, yeah. Offensive linemen back from last year, when they decided to line up on Saturday against Hawaii and push them out of the way, you know, that's when they look their best. So it, it is almost a clash of internal personalities of what this team is, what it can be. I think that's what set this set this Ohio State team apart from almost 
any of our offense in the country, though. I mean, you know, you don't look at TCU and think they're going to line up and just pull their way down the field. You don't look at Baylor and think that. But Ohio State, you don't look at, definitely don't look at Oregon and think that. But you look at Ohio State, and despite all of its spread capabilities with a hybrid back and everything else, they are one of the few teams that also, from the spread, look and line up and just shove it down your throat. And, you know, when they get sort of a feel for when that's correct, which I think they kind of got Saturday against Hawaii as the game went on, that's when they're going to be at their most lethal, in my opinion. Yeah, and I agree. I think I think a lot of a lot of that will be helped because they play such a such a weak schedule here with Northern Illinois and then Western Michigan and then a lot of mediocre big a lot of mediocre big team Big Ten teams at the at the beginning of the conference schedule. I think that'll help a lot. And also as the game went on, I think I think Ohio State was just able to wear down Hawaii, and I think that helped a lot. But looking at the other side, which we haven't we haven't really touched on, is Ohio State's defense was just so incredibly dominant. Uh, Gary and Connolly. Looks like we, we weren't really sure whether he would be the weakness because he had to fight for his job in the preseason. And I was just so impressed with him. And then Darren Lee was an absolute animal, despite having that slip up, on, slip up mentally on, that, on the punt, which he just destroyed the punter there. How impressed have you been with the Ohio State's defense? They came in with a lot of hype, but, but they seem to be even – they seem to be even better than we thought. Like I can't even think of a, I can't really think of a clear hole. Is there something that they need to work on that's obvious, or do they just need to keep on doing what they're doing? Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, I mean, it's kind of hard to say. Yeah. Uh, just coming off the first two games because they were so different games, in my opinion. But what stood out in both of them is they made big plays defensively in both of those games, and that's the way they ended last season when they finally got this. You know, this Chris Ash scheme sort of down, that meaning uh, you're not you're not always going to stone a team for play to play, but play for the big play. You're going to, you know, if you do that enough, you're going to get some, you know. And uh, and the combination was Saturday, this last past Saturday against Hawaii, it was a combination of both. They sort of stoned Hawaii when they needed to, but they also got the big play. And think about it, Von Bell could have three interceptions in that game, plus the stupid score. <laughs> yeah. He could have had he could have had the day of days. Jack Taylor knows that. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, but uh but it didn't you know it didn't quite work, but yet Gary and Conley, you know, I I will say this, I disagree with you about Gary Conley. I just based on guys I was talking to within the team and around the team, there was a sense that Gary Conley was the other corner going into camp. I mean, Damon Webb is a guy that they really like is coming along and stuff, but they really like Gary and Conley as spring went along. And in preseason camp, uh, as it started, he didn't do anything to dissuade that. As a matter of fact, in our, uh, in our game day plus section this week, which comes out on Saturday, I have a spotlight player, you know, for each team. The spotlight player I've got is on Gary and Conley this week for Ohio State because, you know, that interception and the two pass breakups he had, those were big in that game on Saturday. But they also cemented what he's all about. I don't know if you guys agree with me. You know, I kind of started watching him a little bit, man. He was smothering his man. I mean, he was, he was, I'm not going to call it Gary and Island, but it was Elisa Dismas. <laughs> yeah, he I, was awesome. Dismas. Yeah, I thought it was. He was Elisa Dismas out there. <laughs> and, uh, and he was getting it done. And uh, I think he's only going to get better. Because, you know, like Darren Lee said, you know, when I, when I asked him about it the other day, uh, you know, he, he thinks Gary is probably the fastest guy on the team. If you watch him, he's quick. He's got great athletic ability, like like uh, Darren, Darren Lee said. He's an incredible basketball player. He can even windmill dunk, you know. He's only six foot, six foot one. I mean, the sky's the limit for that guy. And you can see the confidence with which Eli Apple is playing right now. So I think they're in pretty good stead with their defense from the standpoint of they're feeling confident about playing that press corner look and then playing, playing hardball with the other nine guys. I think it's been extremely encouraging to see that how the defense is played. Obviously, people knew the offense was going to be loaded, but and they thought the defense was going to be loaded, and it just they've come through so well. And I remember leaving the game on Saturday. Somebody said how, well, I guess it is permissible that the defense would win a game for their, for Ohio State, and it's like, well, yeah, I guess so. They're deep enough on both sides of the ball, so it was very very encouraging to see. Obviously, Hawaii not the greatest offensive team, but still still a great performance by the defense. Now, looking ahead to North. The offense still found way, a, a way to score four touchdowns. You know what I mean? Just right. like they were having a bad day. 
you know, any other team would take four touchdowns in a heartbeat. You know, I mean, I, I'm not going to – I thought the thing that bothered you about the Austin offense was how disjointed it looked. But they still press, you know, they still showed that they were, I guess, superior, for lack of another word. And that's what stood out to me about the offense performance. As bad or as, as disjointed as it looked, it's just scored four touchdowns. You know, that wins most games. No, I think you make a great point, and people have this expectation that they want to start beating teams by numbers, and they don't just focus on just winning games. And right now, Ohio State is winning games, and people should just appreciate that because before the year before Urban Meyer came, six and seven. That's that yeah. was not a very fun result, not a very fun Let season. Let me ask you this: After the second, after the middle of the second quarter, when Ohio State went to fourteen to nothing. And you saw what the defense was doing. You guys were sitting there watching, just like I was. Did you have any doubt Ohio State was going to win the game? Zero yeah, doubt. Yeah, there, there was never really, there never, was never any doubt. Looking, like everybody else, you were, it was, you knew it was a forty-one point spread. Everybody gets wrapped up in that crap anymore. <laughs> you know, you were. Everybody was looking for style points, and uh, you know how, you know how, what kind of dress, you know, are they got to wear. You know what I mean? The red carpet thing, you know. And it was like. Hey, 38 to nothing is a butt kicking, you know, no matter how you wrap it up. It wasn't as, as great a butt kicking as, they, as people wanted, but 38 to nothing, considering Alabama struggled, you know, basically beat, what, Middle Tennessee State 37 to 10, and you saw what happened when, when uh, mighty Toledo went to Arkansas. You know, <laughs> uh, I thought, you know, all things considered on that Saturday when there was a lot of, a lot of funny stuff going on in the air, I thought that was a pretty – Pretty good win, all things considered. Absolutely. And looking forward, talking about uh, games where Ohio State's supposed to roll. Uh, this weekend, they're playing Northern Illinois MAC team, but one of the better MAC teams. They've averaged 594 yards per game in their first two games. Granted, they were against Murray State and UNLV. Is there any reason to believe that Ohio State, minus maybe getting in their own way, won't just dismantle Northern Illinois this weekend? Well, the thing about Northern Illinois is their history, their recent history, going back to when Jerry Kill was there, but especially the last six, five, six years. I mean, number one, they won 11 games or more in the last five years. Number two, they were in the Orange Bowl three years ago, was it two, three years ago, when Jordan Lynch was there and finished third in the Heisman Trophy race. Uh, number four, they play offense, but getting off the bus, they try to score points, and they've been very effective with that no matter who they played. As Herbert Meyer pointed out earlier this week, you know, they've beaten three big, ten, three big Ten teams in the last couple of years, last several years. So they won't be in awe of the uh, setting. Uh, you know, whatever team can score, it's got a chance, like a puncher's chance, you know. Uh, as they say in boxing, you've got to probably go in thinking you're going to have to score points too. you got to get it done. With that said, I've watched video of them. They're not a great defensive team by any stretch. <laughs> and, uh, of course, you did think, you didn't think of why he was either, you know, but I'm no, wondering there's a way to at least throttle Ohio State, not, not stop them, but at least throttle them. And uh, so, I mean, strange things happen, guys. Toledo went to Arkansas and won. I'm not equating Arkansas with Ohio State by any stretch. <laughs> believe me. <laughs> well, believe on me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, you've got to go in thinking you've got to play your game. You've got to be on top of your game. That's what college football is all about anymore. You fall off that knife's edge. And you make yourself gain to any, any, any opponent. Right. And no doubt about it. I mean, Ohio State didn't exactly roll a week ago. I mean, getting into a different conversation that we just had. But, I mean, you talk about Northern Illinois history. And if they win a MAC championship the year after that Orange Bowl, they're going back to another BCS Bowl. So, yeah, they're a team that's always in the mix. In the MAC West, which is an underrated division for mid majors. But,. Just going into this game, is there one thing in particular that you'd like to see Ohio State do better or maybe a multitude of things that you'd like to see them do better? Yeah, but first I'd like to say I think I think I may be right on this. I think it's Mac Mid American Conference West one, Southeastern Conference West. Zero. That's what I yes, <laughs> that's what I've heard. <laughs> yeah. Now what was the question? I forgot the question. Is there just one one or a couple things that you want to see Ohio State do a lot better? down the track, I mean, you know, I, I really think an underutilized, and I know they've got to spread the ball around, I don't think they spread
spread the ball around to keep anybody happy, by the way. I think they spread the ball around to create situations to where the defense can't just tee off on them. Yet Hawaii did tee off on them. You know what I mean? And uh, I think the thing that I personally, like, I think this guy is a big-time player. I, you know, I think getting Michael Thomas involved with more catches is, because uh, I think he's, you know, you watched him against Kendall Fuller. He made Kendall Fuller look foolish two or three times. You know, Kendall Fuller supposed to be a, maybe a first-round draft pick as a, as a quarterback. I think getting Michael Thomas more involved in the offense would be a good thing for Ohio State instead of, like, just feeding it, shoving it down people's throats if their hybrid back is going to be the guy, you know? And because uh, I think the more Michael Thomas is involved, the more the hybrid back is going to be more effective. I agree with you. Uh, I think Michael, he only got a couple throws the entire game. He got that one deep ball where Hawaii got called for pass interference, and it's like, well, I don't understand why I hadn't been throwing that all game. But looking forward, we like to end the show with predictions, and uh, I'm not going to pull your arm if you don't, you don't want to make one, but if you'd like to, uh, what do you think the outcome of this game will be, just to score in a winner? I think I, I know who you're going to you know pick. What? but I picked Ohio State 52 to – last week, so I got—I think I got the spread correct. <laughs> Thirty-eight <laughs> points, but uh, I think the Ohio State fifty-point show is going to show back up. That's what I think, and uh, I don't think North Illinois will be able to keep up with that. So it'll be somewhere in the fifties to get somewhere in the maybe the teens. I, I think North Illinois is good enough on offense to score a couple of times, but the caveat is uh, this defense. This I think defense is really. Feeling its own choice right now, man. They, they, you know, and they've got the best pass rusher in college football back at Joey Bosa. Uh, that showed last week. I mean, the attention he brought, uh, not just from guys like us watching him, but the attention he brought from the opposing offenses. I think it's just going to open things up more and more for, for Darren Lee. You know, I mean, wow, there's a guy that has come from nowhere. Uh, yeah. He's been amazing. 13 months, ago, 13 months ago to like one of the elite players in college football. So I can see Ohio State handling business big time on Saturday with a full week to prepare. Yeah, and I agree. I, I, I think Ohio State's going to roll just based on the defense alone. There, there's I really don't even see that there's much of a chance that someone like Northern Illinois will win. I don't think that they're going to give up more than 10 points. I've got Ohio State 48-10. to 10. I, I think that's as that's as well as as Northern Illinois can do on offense against Ohio State's defense, even though they have played very well on offense despite despite the lesser competition. I really see Ohio State rolling. Give me fifty eight seventeen. I think Northern Illinois maybe scores a couple touchdowns late. I think Ohio State rolls in the first half. Urban Meyer has them ready to go, and Ohio State just they're playing backups in the second half and that's how Northern Illinois gets their points. But Tim may, we do appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you very much for joining us this week. Hey, anytime I can help the student calls, man, you let me know. Thank you so right, much. Man, I appreciate it. Appreciate <laughs> it very unless much. There's a, unless there's a donation involved. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Not, not from us. So that will do it for us this week on the show from the shoe. Uh, Game is at 3.30 on ABC or ESPN2. Not really sure which one. I'll be at the game, so I don't really care as much. But for my co-host, Colin Hustle, I'm Dan Herbener. Uh, we'll see you next week.